uh, for the bombing out in uh, Colorado, um, may have had strong ties to the Iraqi government. Now, if that had been checked out uh, at the time, we might know more uh, now uh, than, uh, than we do. It's at least interesting that Yusuf was behind two plots, the one to bomb the World Trade Center and the other to blow up a number of American airliners in the Pacific, uh, the one that he was caught while trying to, to perpetrate in 94, 95. So this plot that was hatched today, in a way, is a kind of a combination of the earlier two use of plots. I think we need to very carefully look at all of the history of these terrorist operations and every shred of evidence that we may have uh, uh, on this one and see uh, if there's any chance there was state involvement behind it because uh, indignation and action is not enough. We need to have indignation and action at the real perpetrators, and as yet, we just don't know who those are. All right, Mr. Woolsey, stand by. I want to try to bring back uh, Senator Hagel, uh, who's also here in our Washington bureau. Uh, the former CIA director, Mr. Woolsey, suggesting that perhaps all the finger pointing, direct finger pointing that we've heard through much of today toward Osama bin Laden may be premature. Maybe they, uh, others could have been involved, specifically the Iraqi government. What do you hear? Well, uh, we must not rule anything out here as possibilities. We do know something, uh, I think, for certain here, uh, Wolf, and that is this was a very sophisticated operation. It took a great amount of intelligence, a great amount of resources, timing, all that goes into something like this. The world's never seen anything this sophisticated. Now, whether bin Laden was part of that or could have had the ability and the resources to do that, I don't know. But uh, Jim Wolsey's right. Uh, no one should escape the net here as we find out who did this, and we will find out who did this. Is there a sense, though, that, uh, Senator Hagel, is there a sense that, uh, uh, that it definitely was some Middle East-oriented group that coordinated this attack, that it was not necessarily, as Oklahoma City was, a homegrown U.S.-sponsored attack? Uh, I don't know the facts here, but I would think it quite unlikely uh, that it would be a uh, homegrown domestic group uh, involved here. Uh, I, I just don't that, think that I would be the case. Uh, what part of the area of the world uh, these uh, perpetrators and cowards are from, I don't know. Stand by. Here's the Attorney General in the White House briefing room, John Ashcroft. Today, America has experienced one of the greatest tragedies ever witnessed on our soil. These heinous acts of violence are an assault on the security of our nation. They are an assault on the security and the freedom of every American citizen. We will not tolerate such acts. We will expend every effort and devote all the necessary resources to bring the people responsible for these acts, these crimes, to justice. Now is the time for us to come together as a nation to offer our support our prayers for victims and for their families, for the rescue workers, for law enforcement officials, for every one of us that has been changed forever by this horrible tragedy. The following is a summary of the known facts surrounding today's incidents. American Airlines Flight 11 departed Boston for Los Angeles, hijacked by suspects armed with knives. This plane crashed into the World Trade Center. United Airlines Flight 175 departed Boston for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the World Trade Center. American Airlines Flight 77 departed Washington Dulles for Los Angeles, was hijacked and crashed into the Pentagon. United Airlines Flight 93 departed Newark for San Francisco, was hijacked and crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Crime scenes have been established by the federal authorities in New York, in Washington, D.C. area, in Pittsburgh, in Boston, and in Newark. The full resources of the Department of Justice, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, the U.S. Attorney's Offices, the U.S. Marshals Service, the Bureau of Prisons, the Drug Enforcement Administration, and the Office of Justice programs are being deployed to investigate these crimes and to assist survivors and victim families. 
uh, thousands of FBI agents in all of the field offices across the country and in the international legat offices, assisted by personnel from other Department of Justice agencies, are cooperating in this investigation. The FBI has established a website where people can report any information about these crimes. That address is www.ifccfbi.gov. That address again, www.ifccfbi.gov. Individuals can report any information they know about these crimes to that website. It takes courage for individuals to come forward in situations like this, and I urge anyone with information that may be useful and helpful to authorities to use this opportunity. The Office of Victims of Crime has established a toll-free 800 number for family and friends of victims. They can call 800-331-0075 to leave contact information for a future time when more information is available, to find out information about a victim or to find out information about the rights of victims and the services available to victim survivors and victim families. The determination of these terrorists will not deter the determination of the American people. We are survivors, and freedom is a survivor. A free American people will not be intimidated, nor will we be defeated. We will find the people responsible for these cowardly acts, and justice will be done. Tommy. Every single American lost something today. And every one of us at this time expresses our deepest sympathy to the victims of today's tragedies and their families. It is now our mission to begin the healing from this tragedy. From the moment that we learned of these attacks, the Department of Health and Human Services has begun readying teams and resources to be sent to New York City and the Washington area to meet any needs of state and local officials. So far, we have sent four disaster medical teams to New York City and three of these disaster medical teams to the Washington, Northern Virginia, Baltimore area. These medical teams each consist of about 35 physicians, nurses, and emergency medical technicians. They are all trained to deal with traumatic injuries and other emergency needs. We've also sent four disaster mortuary operational response teams to New York and three to the greater Washington area. We're also in the process of shipping a great deal of emergency medical supplies to New York City with the help of the Centers for Disease Control. In short, we're making the full force of the Department of Health and Human Services, both its resources and medical expertise available to the areas that need our assistance. We've also this afternoon activated the United States Public Health Service Commission Corps, which consists of approximately 6,000 health professionals. We also are giving backup assistance to the 500-bed ship Comfort from the United States Navy. Americans all over are calling up and asking what they can do. The best thing they can do is respond to this great call by volunteering to give blood. We need Americans to continue to answer that call. No matter where you live, please do your civic duty and assist us by donating blood. It is our primary job is to make sure Americans harmed by this tragedy get the help that they need. We will remain in constant contact with the governors, the mayors, public health officials, and other local officials to make sure that all their needs are being met.
It is a sad day, but America and all of its citizens certainly share tonight in the grief that it's been caused. And as the President and everybody in his administration have said, we, the government, will continue to operate and continue to provide the services to all Americans. One of the most uh, cherished freedoms is the freedom of movement, the ability to move freely and safely. But today that freedom was attacked. But we will restore that freedom throughout the national transportation system as soon as possible. We're looking at a picture uh, also on Capitol Hill where the uh, Senate and House leadership is preparing to speak uh, flanked by hundreds of members of the U.S. Congress. Here's the Speaker of the House, Dennis Haster. The hearts and souls and feelings of the victims and the families that were a part of this great tragedy that happened in this country today. Our prayers and thoughts and, and words of, of, of consolation goes out to all those who have suffered. But one thing that happens here in this place <coughs> is when Americans suffers and when people perpetrate acts against this country, we as a Congress and as a government stand united <coughs> and we stand together. Senators and House members, Democrats and Republicans will stand shoulder to shoulder to fight this evil that's per been perpetrated on this nation. We will stand together to make sure that those who have brought forth this evil deed will pay the price. We're not sure who this is yet. But we have our suspicions, and when that is justified and when those suspicions are justified, we will act. We will stand with the President, we will stand with this government, and we will stand as Americans together through this time. Thank you. Today's despicable acts we're an assault on our people and on our freedom. As the representatives of the people, we are here to declare that our resolve has not been weakened by these horrific and cowardly acts. Congress will convene tomorrow And we will speak with one voice to condemn these attacks, to comfort the victims and their families, to commit our full support to the effort to bring those responsible to justice. We, Republicans and Democrats, House and Senate, stand strongly united behind the President and will work together to ensure that the full resources of the government are brought to bear in these efforts. Our heartfelt thoughts and our fervent prayers are with the injured and the families of those who have been lost. We know as a nation, as we said, our thoughts and prayers are with those families and those injured and those who are the casualties of today's attack. We also remember those thousands of people who are rescue workers. We ask now that we all bow our heads in a moment of silence and remembrance.
Thank you. Pointed uh, display of bipartisan unity at this critical moment in U.S. history. It seemed like a spontaneous uh, singing of God Bless America by scores of members of the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate, seriously trying to send a message of unity during this difficult moment. Uh, let's go back to Paula Zahn in New York, where she's got more details on this tragic day uh, in, uh, in Manhattan. Paula? Thanks so much, Wolf. I think all day long you have seen the images replayed of exactly what happened here in New York City. Uh, the city a victim of multiple attacks by hijacked commercial airlines. Joining me right now is Matt Cornelius, who was in the unfortunate position of being mid-level in Tower One, the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Matt, thanks for joining us tonight. My what friend. happened? Where were you? Well, I just arrived at work uh, probably about 8.40 a.m. I put my lunch away and uh, I was putting uh, you know, getting ready to start the day when uh, all of a sudden we heard this tremendous crash. It was a, a really loud sound, followed by a, sh a sharp jolt in the building, and, and then the, the floor kind of seemed to wave. Um, Somebody we are looking at this incredibly dramatic shot of the impact of the American Airlines hitting the North Tower. You were not aware at all of what could have caused it. We had no idea. Uh, obviously, we knew something had struck the building. Um, somebody s screamed out, uh, and airplanes hit the building. But I, th you know, I think that was just a guess. And uh, when I thought about that, I thought probably a private plane, because you often see them flying around the World Trade Center. Uh, I, no one could have ever thought that it was a commercial jet plane of, of that size. Um, and your immediate instinct, I, I suppose, was to get out of the building. Yeah. Describe the uh, evacuation. Well, it wasn't, uh, because people w hadn't really arrived to work yet, it wasn't very organized. We basically uh, oh, shit. Now that actually represents the second attack that, that the happened attack. 18 minutes after your building was That's struck. Right. So when, when, we got, uh, when we got struck, uh, everyone basically started running for the stairways. Um, and we, we went in Im immediately to the stairways and started our way down. We were actually, people pushing and shoving, or was it an orderly um, exit from the People building? were confused at first, but once we were in the, in the stairway, people were very orderly. Um, How long did it take you to get out of the building? About 45 minutes. Uh, some people were upset uh, they had gone through the, the bomb in 93. How could it take so long to get out of the building? You had 65 flights of stairs, well, you're a young a man, you're, but one would think well, you could get out of there quicker. We, we moved quick, uh, very quickly, probably 15 minutes to the 40th floor, and then after that, uh, we got held up. There were firefighters coming up the stairs, uh, police officers, and I believe FBI agents. Uh, so they were coming up, um, and, and there were people, there was a man in a wheelchair who uh, they were trying to assist, so we kind of had a hold for him. Um, but people remained calm throughout this and, and kept saying, you know, we're, we're going to take it one stair at a time, we're gonna, everybody's going to get out. And, uh, I think uh, we, we weren't aware of the situation. We, we thought it was an isolated event. Uh, I think had we known what was going on, it would have been a different story. But These pictures obviously show the unspeakable horror and tragedy, the fallout uh, from which we're only just beginning to grasp. Once you got out of the building, mm -hmm. at what point did you become aware of what had truly happened? Well, I would say the minute uh, as we came out of the building, actually exited the complex, uh, the police officers were screaming, don't look up, don't look back, just go. And uh, I, of, I, of course, looked back, and uh, I saw that the second tower was indeed on fire. And that's, that's when it hit me that this was something major. I mean, this, this was a real catastrophic event. Um, 
and, and actually, when we came out of the stairs, there was uh, a lot of devastation in the lobby, and, and actually, the center of the uh, the complex, the plaza area, uh, there was a lot of uh, debris and, uh, and uh, some bodies. I mean, it, it was truly awful. We have some shots now that we'd like to show you of, of what some people have described almost as a, a nuclear winner when they talked about the amount of soot coming down on those of you who, who were fleeing these, right. these buildings. Uh, now that you've been able to absorb what happened, mm -hmm. what's going through your head tonight? Uh, you must I'm, feel like I'm, a very lucky I'm, man. I feel very lucky. I, I'm so thankful to be alive. Uh, my heart goes out to those who, who don't know about their loved ones or uh, you know, have lost loved ones. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, it's still very surreal. I mean, uh, you know, I, I look down behind us and uh, can't believe that my office building that I go to every day is, is gone. Matt, before you go any further, we were just looking at shots of the countless number of New York firefighters that were on the scene. We are just getting information from a union official of some of the 400 firefighters that initially went into that area. 200 oh may God. have perished. Matt, uh, we appreciate your sharing your thoughts with us tonight on this incredibly tragic to today of uh, our American history. Uh, let's go back to Wolf Blitzer. Once again, Wolf, New York City officials are not confirming, nor is the Pentagon exactly, how many people were injured here or uh, how many people died. I know Governor Pataki of New York was, was saying earlier this evening it will be many, many days before we have any of those numbers. Those numbers are being collected, but I'm sure it's way too early, as you point out, Paula, to, uh, to have even a rough guess how high that uh, number will eventually go. Uh, just to re, uh, recap once again, President Bush preparing to address the nation in less than an hour or so, around 8.30 p.m. Eastern, an Oval Office address for President Bush from the White House. CNN senior White House correspondent John King is back on the North Lawn of the White House. John, uh, you were, oh, you're back in the briefing room now. John, you, you were listening to that briefing when we went to the C Capitol Hill congressional leadership uh, statements that were being made. Uh, was there any hard news that came out of that briefing? Indeed, there was, Wolf. Some details on the emergency responses taking place, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, other agencies taking steps to provide medical and other disaster relief personnel, but also from the Treasury Secretary, Norman Mineta, a glimpse of what will be the near future, at least, for Americans now traveling around the country. Mr. Mineta saying as a result of this, a, first and foremost, that he will make the decision tomorrow if and when U.S. commercial air traffic can resume, all planes grounded at least through noon, he said, and when Americans do go to an airport or a train station in the future, they are likely to see a much higher level of security. To increase traveler security. Travelers will indeed see increased security measures at our airports, train stations, and other key sites. There will be higher levels of surveillance, more stringent searches. Airport curbside luggage check-in will no longer be allowed. There will be more security officers and random identification checks. Travelers may experience some inconveniences, but we ask for your patience. Now, the president is in the Oval Office with his national security team preparing for that address to the American people about 50 minutes away from now. That address from the Oval Office, four members of the president's cabinet briefing here. They refuse to take any questions. White House saying that these cabinet agencies want to gather more information. Attorney General John Ashcroft vowing, though, that the perpetrators of these terrorist attacks, he said, would be discovered and punished. And again, much of the information dealing with the relief or effort underway over at the Pentagon and up in New York City, the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Tommy Thompson urging Americans, no matter where they live, to donate blood. He said that is one urgent priority right now. Wolf. Okay, John King, we'll be back to you. But meanwhile, I want to bring in the former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, who joins us here in our Washington Bureau. Uh, Secretary Albright, do you have a sense, uh, you studied this situation four years at the United Nations, four years at the State Department, who was responsible for this attack? I think it's impossible to tell at this time, Wolf, and it's very important to get all the facts straight. But what is essential is that the countries of the world who believe in democracy and human rights stand together 
And I, the statements that have come out, I think, from other world leaders are very important. Uh, we all have to stand together. I ache for America tonight, but I know that we will rise to the challenge because we have the best system in the world. Is there, a, a, given the earmarkings of this highly sophisticated, very coordinated attack, that states, some sort of state sponsorship was behind it? I think it's a tempting to speculate, Wolf, but I think that it's probably wrong at this time uh, to make statements that point the finger. We need to look at the facts very carefully and then respond at a time and place of our choosing. We have the best military in the world. I have the greatest confidence in our military, and I support President Bush. We are all waiting to hear what he has to say. I think the unity of this country is now essential. But even at a time of unity, we've heard from many members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans today, uh, members of Congress lamenting what they say was an enormous intelligence and security failure. Intelligence in the sense that the U.S. apparently had no advance indication that this was about to happen, and a security failure that four planes could be hijacked simultaneously. I think we will have a lot of time for investigation and finger pointing. I think today we need to offer our condolences to the families of the victims and the bravery of those who have rescued people, and remember that this country is a country of laws and those who oppose us are only countries that do not believe in a system of laws and democracy and the individual freedom. You just heard the uh, Transportation Secretary Norm Mineta say that uh, travel in the United States is not going to be as relatively easy as it's been. There's going to be much tighter restrictions for Americans. They will have to endure what many Europeans have been enduring now for several years, given the terrorist operations unfolding there in other parts of the world. It's going to cause a reaction, as you, you well can understand, from the American public. I think that's the least of our problems. I know when I fly, I actually welcome it when I'm asked questions, and I think it is up to all of us to cooperate. But America can't be shut down. We have to remember that we thrive as an open society, and I think we have to take all the precautions and to try to find the balance between the freedom for which we are noted and the security which we need. Once the United States learns conclusively who was responsible for this coordinated attack, what should the response be militarily and diplomatically politically? Well, I think militarily I will leave that to the defense people. I do know that we have the means to respond uh, in whatever way we want to. We do have the best and strongest military. Diplomatically, I think it is essential to be in touch with our friends and allies, to seek their unified support. Terrorists know no boundaries, they know no limits, and this has been brought home to America this time, but other countries are being threatened and we need to all stand together. Terrorism can only be dealt with internationally. You were the Secretary of State when the U.S. embassies in East Africa were bombed. Uh, many Americans were killed. Many other uh, nationals were killed as well. The U.S., while you were Secretary of State, did bomb uh, some bases in Afghanistan believed to have been associated with Osama bin Laden. A Sudanese uh, factory was bombed. Clearly, if Osama bin Laden was responsible for this current attack, which has been widely speculated, of course, the U.S. retaliatory strike at that time didn't appear to slow him down at all. Well, there's no way to prove that, and the truth is that my worst day as Secretary of State was when those embassies were bombed and when I brought the bodies home and met with the Kenyans and Tanzanians who had been injured. The United States has to respond. We have to respond on the basis of the facts we have, not on the basis of speculation, and I think that the important part is for us to all stand together and be supportive of President Bush. Uh, we're going to be showing some pictures, uh, uh, Madam Secretary, uh, of some U.S. warships. Recently, uh, we're in Norfolk, moving out into the Atlantic Ocean, up the Atlantic coast uh, to get out of port. Uh, we're taking a look at some destroyers and some frigates now. These are pictures of uh, U.S. Navy vessels leaving uh, the largest U.S. naval facility in Virginia, in Norfolk, uh, clearly perhaps sending some sort of uh, signal, some sort of sign to others who may be out there. What is that message? That America is strong and cannot be shut down. Uh, that we have the means to uh, bring about uh, some kind of a response to this and that we have the strongest military in the world and that we're proud of our military. General uh, Colin Powell, your successor at the State Department, uh, returning tonight from a visit to South America from Lima, Peru. What should he be doing right now? What do we assume he is doing to generate international diplomatic support 
for the United States position and for perhaps some retaliatory U.S. response. I can understand that he must be very frustrated not to be in Washington because I was not in Washington when the embassy bombings happened. I was in Rome and I came back right away and what I'm sure he is doing is being in touch with his counterparts and mustering the kind of international support that is necessary and I'm sure will be forthcoming from our friends and allies because we're in all of this together. Madam Secretary, it was good uh, for you to join us uh, on this horrible day in American history. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Wolf. Back to you in New York, Paula. Thanks so much, Wolf. Uh, we're going to try to give you a better perspective of the state of paralysis here in New York City tonight. Uh, once again, we cannot confirm the number of injured, the number of killed here today, but we have just gotten confirmation from a union representing New York City firefighters that as many as half of the 400 firefighters that were initially sent to the World Trade Center area are presumably dead tonight. Uh, we have been told that victims have been transferred to some uh, 70 area hospitals. Uh, there are pleas for donations of blood from New York City. Uh, residents, uh, I in fact tried to uh, donate blood today and there was as much as a five hour line of volunteers uh, all trying to uh, heed this plea. Right now I'm going to check in with Greg Clarkin who joins us from St. Vincent's Hospital where more than several hundred of the injured uh, were taken. Greg, what can you tell us tonight? Yeah, we're about a block away from St. Vincent's Hospital in Lower Manhattan. This is one of the locations that has been set up since uh, for a triage unit, as a triage unit, since early this morning. Really an incredible scene. Possible. What you see is dozens and dozens of hospital workers outfitted in their scrubs, just basically awaiting, uh, awaiting victims to treat. Uh, at this point, what we're hearing is that uh, the pace has slowed down considerably. We've just been briefed by the president of St. Vincent's, that is David Campbell. He says at the moment there are 319 patients at St. Vincent's. Of that, 50 to 55 are listed in critical condition. He also confirmed that there were three deaths at St. Vincent's. Also, New York Governor George Pataki stopped by. He spoke to the doctors as well as the victims. One of the doctors overseeing the operations in the emergency room today uh, described some of the injuries that they saw early, early on. He said at the very early stages of this tragedy, what they saw were severe burns, a lot of trauma, and a lot of heart-related problems. Now, he said the heart attacks and cardiac arrest could be from pre-existing heart conditions or possibly induced by the trauma that the uh, people saw at the uh, World Trade Center today. Now, tomorrow they expect to get a different type of injury. Right now, the Trade Center is considered a hot zone. There are no rescue efforts underway, the doctor said, but tomorrow they expect that hot zone to be lifted rescue workers to go back in what they will be expecting then is uh, what they call crush injuries and that could be broken bones anything uh, anything that happens by uh, people being buried underneath rubble kidney failure uh, failure dehydration and the like they're expecting to see a whole different variety of injuries tomorrow so again from st. Vincent's which has been a triage unit throughout the day the scene has slowed down a little bit but they do expect it to pick back up when the rescue efforts resume Paula back to you all right, thanks so much, Greg. And uh, during your report, I just got more information that the New York Police Department now confirms that there are 78 police officers on its force that are missing tonight. Right now, I'm going to turn to Richard Holbrook, uh, former UN ambassador, uh, to, to provide some sort of perspective for us this evening. Mr. Holbrook, we have heard General Shelton describe today's uh, uh, vicious acts as outrageous acts of barbaric terrorism. Senator Orrin Hatch called it an act of war. Senator John Warner calling it the most tragic hour of American history. What is your perspective on this this evening? Well, well first of all, Paula, as a New Yorker <clears throat> and somebody who had the honor of being guarded by the New York City Police and working with the firemen, I am uh, stricken beyond words at the information you've just mentioned about the death toll among the police and the firemen. Um, I used to work in that building and uh, was there in next door during the previous attack and uh, as, as in the 1993 case, New York City citizens have responded in this extraordinary way. Your description of the attempt to give blood is, is so emblematic, those lines, and I'm just heartbroken about this. In terms of the your question, and having listened to your interview with Madeleine Albright, I just want to add something to what she said, and that is this. In the past, Osama bin Laden and other terrorists who do not represent national governments, a distinction which is critically important, but are sheltered 
in various countries in the world, including Afghanistan, sometimes North Korea, Iraq, Libya, have played this shell game about where the government that shelters them and protects them says, well, we don't know where they are. I think it is absolutely essential for the United States to lead an international effort now that makes clear that any country which shelters people is part of an act of war against the United States. The United States, Paula, cannot make the response alone. It is true, as Madeleine said, that we have the finest military force in the world. And I've been privileged to work with them for over 30 years in Vietnam, in Bosnia, and all over the world. But I will tell you that unless we have international united front of the European allies, the Russians, the Chinese, and, and I want to stress this, the moderate Arab states, which must close ranks to get the extremists who are behind this, we're not going to be able to succeed. This is the beginning after we get through the rescue phase, after we find out how the security failure occurred that you referred to, that Wolf Blitzer referred to earlier, we're going to have to turn to an absolutely nonstop diplomatic effort to create the, bur the pressure behind, behind which we can take the necessary military action against this act of war. All right, I hear what you're saying, Ambassador, but it was Henry Kissinger who said earlier on today that we will be able to, or the United States at least, will be able to judge uh, its friends by their level of support in trying to figure out who unleashed this fury today. What, though, realistically, do you think will happen in, in terms of resistance from some of these countries? I I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. I heard the interview with Henry Kissinger and he and I are in full agreement on this. Any government which shelters the people who did this has to be held equally responsible for it as an act of war. And if any, and we are going to have to mobilize an international coalition for that position as we prepare to take the necessary military responses. And I know that Henry agreed with that because I listened to the interview. Oh, no, I don't think I, I'm saying that anybody has misinterpreted the interview here, but I think there has been some suggestion by other guests that uh, you may not get complete support here. No, I'm not. I don't know whether we'll get complete support or not. The Taliban is denying any influence in this thing, but all the evidence seems to suggest that. John King and others on your excellent coverage have suggested that uh, the administration is 90 percent sure it's Osama bin Laden. Uh, if some countries don't participate, let them understand that they're joining a coalition of terrorists who have declared war on the United States. The key nations involved are going to be the moderate Arab states, the Russians, and uh, the Chinese and other countries which must isolate the cause of this. Osama bin Laden is not a government, but if he is indeed, as the administration appears to believe, behind this, anyone trafficking with him should be on notice that that is tantamount to an act of war by a government. And I talked uh, this afternoon to the Secretary General of the UN, Kofi Annan, okay. who is trying to deal with the consequences of this for the UN. He's going to have to decide whether to postpone or cancel some major UN meetings that are coming up in New York, a children's summit in 10 days. And he has been talking to Arab leaders, and he's, I think he will be very supportive of this. The UN will meet in General Assembly tomorrow to start the condemnation process, and we're going to have to conduct diplomacy alongside rescue and finally decide what the correct military response is. Mr. Holbrook, we're going to have to leave it there this evening. Thank you very much for Thank your you. insights and uh, some of your poignant thoughts on Thank what you, uh, it was like to have once worked in uh, one of those buildings that no longer exist. Joining me right now is Jeff Greenfield, who has some thoughts on the magnitude of what was witnessed here today. I know Senator Dodd earlier today uh, compared this to the equivalent of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Right, and you know, he said, I don't think that overstates it. We may find out it will understate it. When Franklin Roosevelt told us that many American lives were lost on that December 8th speech, he was talking about 2,400 American servicemen and women. 
Unless a miracle happened two and a half miles south of here, we are looking at a death toll that could dwarf that. The largest act of violence in American history, Oklahoma City, 168 dead. More people than that died just in the plains. And when you and I as New Yorkers look and we realize the landscape of New York has changed, the Empire State Building is once again the largest building, I would suggest to you the landscape of America has changed. We are going to wake up tomorrow in a different country. Our luck has run out. Six people died at the World Trade Center in 93. We saved thousands more because the buildings didn't collapse. We averted terrorist acts in the past, not today. And every, I think we will not get on an airplane the same way again. We will not feel the same way about our security again. I looked at some numbers, Paula. The largest number of American dead ever in one day in this country was Antietam, the Civil War battle in Maryland in 1862, 22,000 dead. I hope to God we don't approach that number when all is said and done, but we're going to be possibly in that ballpark. And I think tomorrow, in some ways, may even be a worse day than today because the sheer magnitude of this event has kind of got everybody just excited, ex you know, excited and wondering. Tomorrow the reality sets in. And I think you also talked earlier today how that reality turns from a sense of shock and in some cases a sense of outrage We've already about heard what how, has absolutely. been handed this country. And, and one of the biggest issues we're going to be facing is, is drawing the line between a response that equals the horror of what was done and and restraint. All right, I got to cut you off here and go back quickly to Wolf Blitzer. I think Dick Army is uh, joining you. All right, Paula. The uh, just to remind our viewers that in a little bit more than a half an hour from now, President Bush will be in the Oval Office to address the American public. He's preparing his remarks right now. But our congressional correspondent Jonathan Carl is up on Capitol Hill, and he has uh, the House Majority Leader Dick Army with him. Uh, John. Well, Wolf, an amazing day up here, and we just had about 200 members of Congress, Democrats, Republicans, senators, and members of the House on the steps of the Capitol with a message. Now, we have here uh, the Majority Leader Dick